Are we really? Yes. <laughs> Rocks. Welcome to the last breakout of Jay and Beyond. Wahoo. <laughs> Try it again. Wahoo. Wahoo. Yeah. If you came here hoping to learn this magic phrase, magic with 100%, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> That's how the whole world does responsive, including us. So it's kind of screwed up. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background. Why don't you want to listen to this guy? <laughs> I don't know all that much, uh, but I am here to get in my dutiful plug for the Joomla Resources Directory. Get your, your sign up in there today. You, you too can be listed and be among all those great providers in the Joomla community that uh, it's not just for freelancers anymore, it's for anyone who's in any capacity within Joomla, and uh, get signed up. I play in a lot of the different Joomla teams. Um, I am the trademark manager, which makes for very long days sometimes, um, working on the governance group, the marketing team, and the JRD team, and that's enough to keep me extremely busy. More important, I come from that part of the world, on the other side of the pond, for all of you who couldn't quite place where Utah is, uh, it's in that funny place next to Colorado, which is, is a landmark. Um, our former president is at the top of the R in Colorado, so that you have a, a place for where Paul Orway came from. Uh, Utah is kind of in the middle of nowhere. It is upper desert. It is high mountains. I live at a location that is 2,300 meters in altitude. I am, this is one area in the ski area that I ski patrol at. I live two hills that way, right there. <laughs> 7,000 feet, so real close. Uh, Utah is known for two different kinds of climate. The southern half of the state is the part you, you're more familiar with because of Zion Park and Arches National Park and other kinds of very beautiful red rock places. And the northern half is tall pine trees, high altitude, and a lot of good fun. We are also home of the uh, uh, freestyle events every year, and it is the last stop for people to qualify to go to the Olympics. And that is the longest mogul run in the world. And that's at Deer Valley. Um, you'll find me every now and then at the top of that run. Uh, I am right in here. I'm the guy who's passing out the bibs the guys wear. Uh, so each year, you know, I've got two assignments. That's one of them. Uh, for those people to go down a run that looks a lot like that, it's kind of scary. A little bit interesting. And my other assignment is uh, for two weeks, I work here. And it takes a little time to build that slope and to build all that stuff, but it makes people go high and in the air and have a good time. <laughs> we actually make those jump kickers by putting up concrete forms that are used to, to lay a building foundation. So we just put up these temporary walls, and then we take a snow thrower and start throwing salted snow in there, stacks it up, let it sit for two days, it's frozen solid, pull away the forms, and we have jumps and kickers. So it's got a lot of fun. And then during the event, uh, we have people that go off doing things like that. That's, I wish. <laughs> um, the guy in front of him, that's not me. I took the picture. <laughs> and my normal uh, winter season is ski patrol in this kind of terrain. So that's, that's what I do. And right now, our season's looking more like this, which is the way I really prefer it. Mountain biking season is just getting started. Mud season is over, and we're moving on. And now... For today, our topic, um, going through this in four stages. First of all, to get real clear on what the terminology is that we're dealing with in this area of images. Uh, it does get a little bit confusing sometimes because the terms have been misused and overused and a lot of things are considered responsive. So, so we're going to kind of set what that is. Uh, go into the, the why we're doing some of this stuff, what's magic about doing this in the context of a CMS, and then what the solutions are. Um, we have that guy to thank for the word responsive and the whole concept of responsive websites. You all know how that one works. And the real question is responsive to what? And that's one of the things to keep in mind as we talk through some of these things. But in classic responsive, Ethan only came up with three things to worry about. Can your, can your grid resize and become fluid to match whatever the display space is? So that as the display, display space is larger or smaller within a range, you know, the columns resize as in percentage widths. So that part works out real well. So fluid grids were part of the magic of making responsive work. 
Second was responsive images. That one magic phrase, max width 100%. Don't make a, an image larger than its native pixels so that it doesn't pixelate out on you and explode. Uh, but otherwise, it shrinks down to fit the container that it fits within. And then lay out breakpoints or media queries uh, to keep track of how the, the page will lay out and change the number of columns depending on how narrow your device is. Well, that's all great until you start to have to start working with all this stuff. Uh, some of the magic that we have in the front end is that we can use relative units, so percentages, or M's or REMs. So that's the magic of how you can start switching all of your units of measure for your website front end design to something that changes with the container size. So if you're not working in that mindset yet, get there. Uh, if you're still typing anything with, with pixels, you've got a problem. <laughs> get over it. So start doing your homework and get there. Responsive images, that's our solution for that one, and uh, it works reasonably well. And then on, on the media queries, there are some logical breakpoints, and these are the ones, for those who have not really worked with this yet, these are the ones that I consider to be uh, of interest. So you're really doing small devices, anything under 640. Um, the iPad range, which is, you know, intentionally there's a range right between these two that holds the device in either direction and in being the most frequently used device, you don't really want to change range of images in the midst of how that device is held. You don't want them to pull one size image this way and another size image this way. You only want one download, so go for the widest. So that's why there's no break point between those two numbers. We don't do something for 768. So just a couple of numbers to remember, and then the over 1024 is desktop size. So if you haven't done this before, that's your starting ranges, and go from there. Um, those who have been at this a while, you typically pick up four or five range sets that you find optimum for what you're doing. Media queries have the ability to pick a specific media size to match the range that you're working on. And that's the magic. That's how media queries solve it. So the difficulties with a media query is that you are pulling a specific file for a particular range of um, screen width or container width. And, and that's a matchup. And it's being displayed as a background element. So background elements can be, can be stretched to fit. They can be stretched to cover. Um, you can adjust all those things. But that doesn't solve the front end problem. What happens to that image that you stick in an article? And that's what, what we're talking about today. So the, the, the trade off is whether we're talking about background images or we're talking about foreground images. Foreground images, it can get really complicated. Among the solutions are the ability to set up an image tag that has lots of extra data. And that makes image tags more complicated, especially in Joomla, because we try to do those very automatically. So our second issue is the need for speed. What is the primary reason why we're worried about the image size? Go ahead. And who cares about download time and display of page time? <laughs> and? Anyone who's on a slow device and who else? Google. Google. Two reasons. You'll find that a lot of your clients are experiencing decline in page rank if you're not minding the store in terms of download time. It gets over two seconds and you're starting to have a problem. One of the things that has become one of the insidious little issues in the advent of devices is that people are used to phone apps. And you touch that phone device, and it's a local app, and it responds instantly. And, if it's, so, and it's kind of invisible when you switch over to a web browser, and you touch the device, and you wait 1,001, 1,002, and it comes back. And sometimes you go, maybe I missed the button, so you hit it again. Or maybe it's not that I hit the, the URL wrong, and so you hit back. Well, all those things are being counted by Google to reduce your score. And so you, that's a reason why you need to be much more sensitive to the speed of devices and how long it takes to load. So adaptive images is the idea of sending small device, small image. And that's the difference. We are actually sending a different picture. There are some wonderful statistics that have been collected about this particular issue. 
We don't necessarily need to walk through them, and we'll pop over these a little bit, but it's really to, to understand what people have as an expectation. And so I'm gonna, these will be in the slideshow, which you may download to, to read them in depth and absorb them. Uh, they are from two years ago, so the, the world has changed somewhat. But there is a perspective to be, to be drawn about this. One is that on this particular um, statistical sample is what were people's expectations for a website. Should it load faster or, sm or slower because you're on a small device? Some, uh, some people think small device should be faster, not as, much, not as many pixels to paint. So therefore, everything should come in faster. Not as, I don't need as much information to paint out this little picture. So it's a, there is actually a mismatch of expectation. And um, so in terms of users, you have all different kinds of users that have expectations on this. A sampling of how long it should take for your site page to load on a first page. And some people you know, get really concerned about the number of seconds involved. And those are pretty large numbers of seconds. I mean, we're talking, you know, half the chart is just coming in under 20 seconds. That's pretty amazing uh, that people are that patient. But that's a number of years ago. So that expectation has come down dramatically. Uh, what to do when the site comes in slowly? 40% will leave the site if it doesn't come in within three seconds. And that's where your Google hit really suffers. This is giving you a, a, a good sense of, of where that abandonment rate is based on time. And again, this is two-year-old data. So as you see how long the, it takes for a page to load, you see how, what percentage of people leave and, and the impact of that. So we want to impact that, make it better. These links are in the download for you so that you can uh, go take a look at these. The primary source of information is this spreadsheet, which we'll show in just a few minutes, and it's be still being maintained. It's a Google Doc that's being shared that is keeping track of the different adaptive image techniques and the pros and cons of each one. And then this is a really good uh, blog article about the decision-making process to go through. So. If any of this wasn't clear, that's the place to go and you can walk through it. And now we'll go, go into it. First and foremost, the techniques that started this process was done by a group in Boston who were redesigning the Boston Globe. And they, were, they had the freedom to completely rebuild everything from the server on up. So they didn't have to connect to anybody else. They didn't have to rely on anybody's outside data. So they had to solve their own issue. And they came up with a technique that is called the, the picture fill technique. And so they want, and it has now been proposed to the W3C as a new element, something called a picture element. And it's, of course, going to take five years for it to really come into existence. But this is the long-range plan that's being proposed for what an, an image element would look like with all the data necessary to pull alternative size images. So it's all, this is the built-in, all-in-one solution. If you have the luxury of your own server and the ability to architect um, your own JavaScript to methods to parse that and understand that, you can execute this. So there, the code exists today to, to pull this one off. It's called HighSource, and it's in the list of uh, ones to, to use. It has a number of advantages. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is it's not semantic. The picture element is not understand by Google. Google's not going to parse this and, and understand the content the same way as it would an image element. So that's one of the drawbacks of, of using the cutting edge of this stuff. So, so you may have the perfect image, but it's not going to be showing up on anyone's search rankings on an image search. Uh, it has a serious JavaScript dependency. The picture element doesn't work unless JavaScript is loaded and parsing, and so the older smartphones, the dumb phones, can't, can't operate it. Next is a solution is, is to take it out to a third party. Use, in essence, a content delivery network, a CDN, and in this case, a very specific one called Sencha.io that will request, as a request comes into the CDN, it goes out to the source server of the website, 
grabs the source size image, the big one, pulls it in, it breaks it apart into various sizes, and they keep track of a database of every device that's been manufactured and know precisely what size to send. And this is the, the most perfect match in terms of exactly the number of pixels that the device needs. It is also a paid service. It is also a third party dependency. They go down, you're down. So there's a lot of reasons why people don't like it. You can take your own, own path with this. The same database they run on um, is also available as an open source project. The Werfel database is out there. And every time a new device comes out, people are contributing all the specifications for that device to this database so that you can figure out exactly what to send to it. That's a lot of work. And there are also some third party services who will do this for you as well. Keep, keep the database updated within your site. Yeah. Yep, so a, a number of places that, that the database is available. Again, very complicated. What's the next concern that we want to worry about? Bandwidth. Bandwidth, it doesn't matter what size the screen is, to a degree. You can have a nice large screen, and therefore the software assumes you can take a nice big picture, but if you're on a really slow connection, it could be days before you see that nice big picture. And contrary to that, or vice versa to that, you may on a, be on a very nice small handheld device that you've got the ability to zoom in and you really want to see every pixel that's available. Well, how come you can't get all those pixels delivered to you? Because it thinks, oh, you only have 320 pixels to display. You can't have it. So there are, there's a uh, technique with this JavaScript library that you load it on the front end, you execute it first, and what it's going to do is send down a token image file that's of predictable size and measure how long it takes to come in. And based on that, it will then set a, a size rating to match all the other, everything that comes after that. Mm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's actually the delivery time of the library. It's the companion file to the library. There's now a helper file. So it's actually a useful file that's coming. Yeah. But they're using the delivery time of that useful file that's coming right after this one as yeah, the. Uh, I made some experience. I mean, to get reliable data, I was hitting some 50K mark. Mm -hmm. This is the high source technique. This is what they want for an image tag. That you're putting into data elements the alternative sizes. And the one that's, that is unadjusted is the smallest image size. Why do you think that might be interesting? Why do you want to send the smallest one as the default? It's being loaded by default. Being loaded by default, therefore it works on all the phones that don't have JavaScript. So the littlest phones are served best. And then all the others are, are fallbacks for larger devices, and it's presumed that a larger device has JavaScript. Art direction, a very interesting and kind of unusual aspect of this issue. Uh, it is just emerging. So the idea is that as you get to different smaller devices, you don't just scroll down or, or zoom down the whole image until everybody's little tiny dots. It's you actually decide which portion of the image you're going to show in a particular context. So you, it's a combination of cropping as well as scaling. And you can set both. And that's actually done within the CSS that you can um, determine where the centers are. So if you load a position in a background object um, it, through CSS, you can say that how that, pos that image is positioned within the frame that is filling. So if your frame is from zero to 100% and you've got a zoom in point that you really want to focus on, you can say center this image at 40% horizontal, horizontally and 30% vertically as the crosshairs so that as you zoom this thing down, it zooms in off center. 
very te clever technique, done in CSS, works very well, does not solve the bandwidth issue, does not solve the size of the image issue. It's just how to handle the size of image or the portion of the image to display within a context. Does not handle the zoom level. And, so it's. And, and the <laughs> yeah, this is some. This is for a heavily designed site. This is not something you're going to do with a thousand articles. This is something you're doing with. You are designing a, a site for a photographer, and they're showing off twelve of their. Uh, portfolio images and they want each image to be perfectly cropped at its respective size. That's when you use this. Otherwise, way too much work. There are 24, image, 24 solutions out there. This is the spreadsheet I referred to. Yeah, I'm, I know it's way too small to be able to read it. Um, but it is taking, it is keeping track of all these things we've, we've discussed. And so there is a column for each one of these concerns as to whether or not it requires JavaScript, whether it's using native JavaScript or jQuery, whether or not it is um, requiring more than one load. And this is a, one of the difficult processes. When a HTML page comes in, as, as well as the CSS, all those image tags that have been identified within the script start to be loaded in parallel. It's to make your browser more efficient. It wants to read ahead and start pulling all the assets it possibly can before that little bit of JavaScript at the beginning might have figured out what's the right size. And so it could be starting to pull the biggest image, and then all of a sudden you go, oops, wrong, I need a medium one. Or you default it in the reverse. It starts pulling the smallest image, and you go, oh, this guy can take medium, so start over, bring the, bit, the medium one. You actually have giving yourself a penalty because you're now loading both small and medium for every image you need. <laughs> you got worse. More requests, slows everything down. So, uh, so one of the scores is whether or not it, it requires an image to be loaded in addition to the image that you've re requested. And so that knocks out a fair number of these. Uh, these are all the ones that, that do it on the first request. Um, whether it uses valid syntax is of concern. In, in our world, I don't know anyone who tries to validate a website anymore. But I'm sure at some point, those who have la are laughing, remember the days when you first installed Joomla, religiously knew you had to make sure your website validated, and you worked hours and perhaps days to get that to validate and never quite got there. Oh, then you, then you, but then you changed one of the modules and you started over. <laughs> so, so, valid syntax today really has to do with how well Google can read the page. That's really the, the concept. And some of these alternative data formats and structures, Google doesn't necessarily read the data element the way we are expecting it to be done because there is no microdata format specifically assigned to solve this issue yet. Right on the horizon, getting close, but, that look, but the data tags are meant to be just data. It's more generic than that, and you self-define what your data tag is, and we don't really have a, a specific solution that solves that. So the more valid the syntax is, the more it can be read, the more universal it becomes, um, the better your, your site performance is going to be. Um, does it require additional markup? That's the one I care about most when I'm migrating a 1.5 site. I don't want to go into every article and update the image tag. Anyone want to? We have a whole Joomla community magazine that has over a thousand articles that can be need to be migrated. So, any volunteers? Sure. No. Sorry, go. <laughs> so, that one issue alone narrows down the list rather dramatically uh, because it is one of the most difficult issues. Um, Sorry, sorry just, just it depends on the site how, how you just yep. approach, approach that. Uh, then you've got, finally got to the last two columns, which is our, whether it allows some form of art direction built into the software that is doing the magic, and then whether it does bandwidth testing to help solve those issues. So let's get down to what we wanted to talk about. In the CMS context, are we really going to rewrite that image tag? Hopefully not. But there is a solution. 
Uh, there is actually a very good article that was word, written for the WordPress context that talks about how to, to do rewrites reasonably efficiently and serve them up in that context. It applies just as easily to our context. Right, and you can just pick it up, drop it in. So that is one solution to go look up and play with um, if you want to take that approach. I still think it's a little bit of work. I'm really liking this one, and we're going to go right into it. So adaptive images is, the, is both the name of the talk, in, in part, as well as the name of a specific open source solution that tries to solve these, this set of issues. The nice thing about adaptive images is it can handle a page of statistics like this where you've got a whole bunch of posts to go through and a whole lot of images attached to them and you do, just don't want to do all that, that work. It uh, developed by Matthew Wilcox, um, shared for everyone. Really easy to implement in a Joomla site because there are only three things you have to change. You have to put either an HT access file out there or you have to adapt your Nginx uh, server configuration file. You've got a PHP file to load and you've got a single line of JavaScript that has to be at the beginning of the head of your template. Pretty straightforward. Nothing else has to change. No trips to the database. Way cool. In HT access, there are in essence two lines that are important. One is the rewrite condition, and for an Joomla context, we will we'll say that in our world, because templates have media queries and tend to be all background-oriented graphics, the templates are already doing their own adaptation to a site by virtue of the media queries they're using. So therefore, we're telling it, rewrite condition, ignore templates. Anything in the templates folder. And another condition is ignore anything in the media folder. You know, presume that whatever's in there has probably already been optimized or resized. Um, your example, your particular site may vary, but uh, for the most part, those are the ones to ignore, which leaves what? Images. The reverse of that might be that you just ignore the exclamation point and just put images here and just say, we're only going to deal with the images folder. Either one. And then what are you going to do with it? Everything that comes in with an extension of JPEG, GIF, or PNG, we're throwing it to this PHP file to manage. <laughs> it is. It's very simple, very straightforward. Does the directory include subdirectories so you like media? Would it include the subdirectory for that, or is it just the directory media? So oh, it's, that is a string match. So if it's anywhere in the string. Okay. Uh, this is the Nginx equivalent of what, we, what you just looked at. For those who are doing Nginx, uh, jump ahead to this one. This is what goes in the JavaScript. And this is, there are two variations that they have put up. I put up the more complicated one um, because it's the more appropriate one. And it's simply, do, all it's doing is setting a, a cookie that has two pieces of information, the screen size and the pixel ratio. So is it a retina device? So this is telling you, if this is a retina-style device, send twice as many pixels. If it's an Android on a, on a Samsung, send 1.4 as many pixels. You know, whatever the multiplier effect is, that's what that's keeping track of. So, and this is being based off of screen width, as in physical device width, for a very specific reason. And that is to solve browser caching. If you did it off of display width, and they're initially looking at it in a reduced down window, and then they size up or they go full screen, your cache is still delivering the same image with the exact same name, and so the cache never gets busted. So the, to get around that, we're always sending what it would, what's the best image to show when displayed full screen. So those are the two things that get tossed. If this is run right at the beginning of the head, and it writes the cookie, from then on, every image request, assuming this happens fast enough, every image request will be sending this information so that the PHP file receives it. So it knows then what to do. And this is this, the top of the PHP file. It's a very long file. We're not going to show it. But there's a set of settings. And they're all pretty straightforward. So with those settings, you're determining what are your breakpoints. So if you have in your 
site design, you've decided to do four different versions of the layout, one for narrow phone, one for a small tablet, one for a larger device, and one for giant desktops. So you got four sizes, and you've set four breakpoints. You're loading the same four breakpoints here. Just don't duplicate the effort. Whatever you're doing on the back end or, or on the CSS as a breakpoint, replicate it here. If you've only got three of them, use three. If you've only got two, use two. But just, just match. So that's what this is doing. So that you're using, at all times, you're working within the same design breakpoint, the one for, for the iPad from 762 to 10, 1024, for example. Um, next is you can pick the name of the directory this thing soars in. By default, it goes to AI cache, as in adaptive images cache, root level folder for the, all the modified images to go into. You can choose any folder name you want. We don't care. You may want, for backup reasons or otherwise, you may want to use slash images slash AI cache to stick it inside the images folder because of the way that you're, you're managing file backups on the website. Or if you're positioning them someplace else for Apache to serve directly, either way. Uh, it can be taken out of the root, so you've got lots of possibilities here. When it resamples, what quality? So you can take it down to 50, you can take it up to 100, but you're doing a server-side resampling of the image to get to the, to the just right number of pixels. So what quality of JPEG quality should it come out with? And then whether you want to run the built-in sharpener that's in the, the resampler. And generally you want to run that. Finally, there, I don't know why you would want to turn off watch cache, but <laughs> you can. But what watch cache does is it's saying that for every image that is inside the AI folder, every one of these cached images that's already been built and is available to be served, when it goes to grab it, it's going to look at the date stamp on the image, and it's going to go look at the date stamp on the source file. And if the source file is newer, it's going to rebuild the image. Yes, it is. Anytime you feel like you've gone through and done some cleanup on the site, you have substituted images using new images with old file names. You did some cleanup work on your images and you know, put up a better quality version. But since you don't have to go through and update all your links, you use the same old name. All you have to do for cleanup is get empty the AI file. The AI folder, it'll rebuild itself. So it's just dumping the cache like we're used to, to doing. Clean out the cache, everything builds fresh. So those are the only settings that you have to set. Works with both Apache and Nginx. So that's, you just got to be aware of which server you're going into. Uh, we talked about the AI cache cleanout. Give you a little bit of sense of what this looks like in different contexts. Let's see. Sorry, too many win windows open. So this is what the download looks like. Adaptive images PHP. There is a backup technique called, where well, there's another PHP file called AI cookies. This is an opportunity to work without JavaScript. So if you want to handle devices, users that do not have JavaScript enabled, the, it's an alternative way of determining the device size based upon a piece of CSS that is stuck into the, into the site. And I'm going to leave that for you guys to read on your own time. Um, but it's just an alternative technique. And it just goes into a no script block. So it's a very simple way to just bypass it. So if the no script block is going to execute, then it's, it's going to be requesting a background image that is that image, that PHP file, and it's just enough for it to read um, the dimensions and requirements that are being asked for. It is. Uh, what's it look like on your server? Let's see if I can get to it. Um, I use the default, so the AI images folder is there. You go into it. And all you have is subfolders for each one of the breakpoints. That's all it does. And it starts sticking images in there with the exact same name so that from a Google perspective, all the analytics perspective, you're always counting the same file name as being delivered regardless of which size is actually coming through. The other two files that you're looking at are down here. Here's the adaptive images PHP. 
and the updated HD access. And we can look at specifically at the code that's in those, which is doot, that one. So here's the rewrite rule that's actually running on a Joomla site. Doot. Here's the settings that are in place for this site. So in this case, these are the, the breakpoint folders you saw. So, and it creates the folders automatically. You don't have to go out and set them up. It, if the folders are missing, it'll rebuild them. Um, the, the root level folder that it's looking for to stick them in. Uh, quality level, sharpening, and caching. <laughs> and how long you're going to allow a browser cache to retain it. So it works very straightforward. And finally, this is the, uh, the cookie approach. And um, all it's going to do is default it to send a large size file uh, if it cannot determine from the information that came in what size of device it was. So it's pretty straightforward. It's rather simple technique. Well, it's, 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 it's really sexy. Because, uh, I, I do it more with computers. Uh, so let's talk about it. Yes. So the library is being checked if it's if, if it's a if it's a mobile, if it's a tablet, or if it's a desktop. So uh, if you have a session cookie, mm -hmm. you and you thereby can handle that. I uh, got a, a working that it's under this tablet, desktop, or so on. You have to select select the right folder. Yes. So but it's not a to do there. It's just to be able to run this. It's just called Google Code, and where you really got me hooked in when you said like. If JavaScript is not working, they, they got some callbacks to this. Just a lot of thought has gone into this approach. Yes. Um, for the developers in the room, I'd love somebody to, to build a Joomla installer for this. You have to be able to write to, to HD access or to the Nginx server file. So there's a, there's a fair amount of server configuration that's necessary that um, you've got to be able to sniff it and detect and, and reinstall on that. Yeah. But Right. For example, um, um, I, I use Facebook, which is some technique, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of things required in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's, you, know, it's not, you're not, you don't have a Joomla extension for this right now, because it's too hard to figure out some of these permutations um, that nobody's jumped up there. But to hand install, straightforward. And uh, the thing to note that if you do the corner redrag to resize your, brow your window, um, if you think you're going to be testing this and seeing a jump from large to medium to small, it will not be changing source file because it is being anchored on the physical device of your screen. As long as you keep that in mind, then everything's fine. Um, same idea as you, as you pick your source files. In, when you are designing and you have a breakpoint, set your screen size slightly larger than your breakpoint, but as close to your breakpoint as, pa as practical, and make sure everything looks good at that point, because as you grow larger, you're expanding your white space. But it's make sure that your image is going to position and look well at that closest small level, and that's the one this is going to base off of to make all the copies of that image to work. Yeah? Is there a way to, to amend the root stupid, for example, um, each web site they do? And if you got a, say, big MacBook, you, you throw a big image at it because it says, I've got a 2048 screen. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You, you get the big image, mm -hmm. but actually what I, what I can do is if it's this big uh, device, it's on a small bandwidth, uh, you can just hit like low bandwidth and then the small image screen. Yes. This is also... Uh, Not built into this. There are three of the solutions of the 24 have something like that. And the trick that they're doing in, and it's something we could be doing in J layout, is that they are sending a low fidelity version of the image in a small window with a, in essence, a download button to view it large and modal right next to it. And that's really the image request for the, the full size if you want it. And you can get that full size image on any size of device. So that, that's how you bypass this and give the people the ability to download the original five megabyte file if they really want to download it and send it to somebody. Uh, if there's a reason to do that because, you know, part of 
being truly responsive is that not only are we being responsive to the devices, but we're also being responsive to the user's needs. And then sometimes if it's something like a, a campus map, you don't want the downsized version because you can't read all the landmarks. So you need to send the full size so they can scale it up and, and do whatever they need to do. Come here. Don't know. I know that that happens. I don't know how it, well, it, it's going to be coming to the network um, as a smaller than, than ultra full size image, but the network may still resample again and send you a smaller version. Hmm. Yeah. I haven't tried that one yet. Thanks. Oh, uh, SlideShare, and it's going to be linked from the Jane Beyond page, as usual. Uh, but my ID on there is Duke3D, D-U-K-E, 3D. Pardon me? Oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the red shirts do die. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>